Hello, good evening, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our um, County Mayo uh, History and Heritage Group lecture this evening, uh, Ephemera, Adding Historical Richness to Family Narrative and Genealogy. Case study, Isabella Quinn. Um, I read somewhere today that the Encyclopedia of Ephemera lists 500 categories uh, of ephemera. But what are ephemera and how can we use them to build and better our family trees? I'm really pleased to say that uh, Carolyn McEvy has joined us from the other side of the world uh, this evening uh, to um, help us understand what uh, ephemera are and how they can be of use to us, and uh, specifically in the context of her case study. Carolyn has been traveling to Ireland over the past decade to research her Irish family history. Um, on one of her trips, uh, Carmel committed to studying for a certificate of history of family and genealogical methods and a master of arts history of family at the University of Limerick. Carmel's master of arts dissertation developed from researching a 46 month diary of Irish woman, Isabella Quinn, who lived during the 19th century. The recorded narrative revealed historical references to places, the military, those of social standing uh, in the community and the role of women in society. Carmel notes that ephemera can offer a first-hand view of life as it was. Ephemera are not only of historical relevance, uh, but are an insight into the life of our, uh, our ancestors lived. I'll now hand you over to Carmel, who will talk you through her slides, and afterwards there'll be an opportunity for you to uh, ask some questions, which I hope, in Carmel and myself, we, we can answer. Thanks very much. Good. Thanks, Michael. Um, thanks very much for your warm introduction. And you, and also, um, can I say for your commitment to the County Mayo History and Heritage Group uh, in your regular pre uh, web webinar presentations, which concern details about the history of County Mayo, its people and its culture. Your talks on the Castle Bar JL and the workhouse have been really fascinating, um, particularly uh, so in terms of the detail you provide about the individuals. Um, you certainly set the context, the place, and the historical time frames in your descriptions, and which we all benefit from that in that they are the key anchors for comprehensive research. So I take this opportunity to thank you on behalf of the group for your ongoing and regular commitment. So good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, uh, County Mayo History and Heritage Facebook members, um, County Mayo Genealogical Facebook members, um, members from other groups and, and family and friends who might be logged on this morning. It's uh, 5 a.m. here in Melbourne on Tuesday the 13th of April. This talk, um, as the slide uh, shows there, is about ephemera and how it can add historical richness to family narrative and to genealogy. I'll address these aspects in the next 50 minutes or so. And I'll specifically be using my MA research study um, uh, that's Isabella Quinn and the focus and uh, as a focus an example um, of ephemera and how it can add a, a level of richness. We will have time for questions as Michael has said at the end and if anyone wishes to follow up on, follow up on points that I address. Um, this, is, this is not an academic presentation. Um, I have, um, and I will make note of various authors and, and their study at various times, um, just in case you're interested. But um, should you be further interested, you can certainly get in touch with me on a, on, you know, a, a particular topic if you wish. So in Australia, should I be giving you this talk? Uh, we would certainly acknowledge um, um, our Aboriginal um, forebears. So if I can say that we acknowledge all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, and I'm, I, can I just, I've got pictures here that are covering my screen. Michael, can I, um, I wonder if I can go out of that. Is that any better? Can you see that? Well, it, looks, it looks good from, from where good, I am. Okay. Good. So we acknowledge all, all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as traditional owners of the land on which we walk, live and raise our children. We pay our respects to traditional owners past, present and future. As this presentation is about the life writings and memorabilia of, of uh, the Irish, it's, it's relevant to acknowledge the cultural and spiritual connections to ancestral homelands on the island of Ireland and the historical hardship that its people faced in order to survive and propagate future generations. This connection and understanding is respected and held sacred. So welcome. 
I'm going to talk about today. This, this webinar is going to cover, um, I'll give a bit of an introduction as to who I am shortly. So what is ephemera? Is it useful? The positives and the pitfalls of, of studying in a micro study environment. Um, my Irish connections and research at UL, my specific case study of Isabella Quinn, uh, her voice, her view of life as it was lived and its significance to historical narrative. Um, I'm also going to talk about how to apply and broaden your skill base to contribute further to comprehensive historical and genealogical family research. So who am I? Well, I live in Melbourne. Um, I have Irish ancestry on both my paternal and maternal uh, sides, dating back from my great grandparents. I've had an interest in family history since the 1980s when I did two um, research trips to Ireland with a Melbourne genealogist at the time. I've been to Ireland on 11 occasions. Um, I have ancestry and current family connections to Mayo, to Donegal, to Limerick, to Clare and to Tipperary. Um, I'm particularly passionate about Nina and County Tipperary's social history and certainly um, understand and understandably Isabella Quinn's story. I have a Master of Arts. I have a Certificate in History of Family from UL. Um, I have a Diploma and a Certificate for in Community Services um, in my uh, day job. Uh, and prior to, to being made redundant in COVID, I uh, work in lifestyle in aged care, um, organising and um, drafting and um, um, lifestyle activities for, for um, clients in aged care. I've taught family history skills to seniors at the University of the Third Age, which is community um, learning here in Melbourne. So a brief introduction. A brief introduction um, to my own County Mayo ancestry and geological interests. Um, my travels from Melbourne to Ireland and my study at, at UL, and certainly um, I have further research aspirations. Well, as I've said to you, um, all my Irish, all my ancestry is Irish from my great grandparents back uh, on both my maternal and paternal sides. I've long been interested in family history and family connections. Uh, as I've said in the 80s, I was fortunate to uh, travel to uh, Ireland to do a couple of research trips with a Melbourne based genealogist, Des Regan, at the time. He took a small contingent of eager and in, and in hindsight very green researchers to visit the major repositories in Ireland. Um, we visited and had presentations really at the time from the champions of Irish genealogy, people like Nasha Cleary in County Clare uh, and Brian Turner in Belfast. Um, at the cessation of these trips, of one of these trips, I travelled up to Mayo to the town of Karanaraha in the village in the village of Spring Hill near Bellavari. And I met at the time some distant relatives, the Clark family, whose direct ancestor, Michael Clark, who lived in Bahola, married my great, uh, great aunt, Catherine Vahi of Spring Hill. And that marriage occurred in 1868. So my Mayo connections are to the following families, to the Vahis, to the McDonough's, the Mulhern's, the Hurst's, the Sheridan's, and I can claim um, the Olympian Martin Sheridan um, into my family tree, and certainly Joe Sheridan, who married Kitty Collins, who was, of course, the sister of Michael Collins. So I kind of claim indirectly Michael Collins as well. I know that there's McAfee families in Foxford, um, and I still continue to find linkages to the McAvees to my own family. Um, there was a name change from Vahis to, to McAvee when uh, my ancestor travelled out from Ireland. Um, so I continue to work on that and hopefully we'll be back in Mayo uh, post COVID to spend some time uh, further researching that. However, today my talk really is not about genealogy as, as such. Um, however, if you do have connections to any of those families, I'd certainly be very interested if you'd reach out to me and my email is on the uh, last slide of this presentation. So in 2011, I resumed my regular trips to Ireland. Uh, as you know, in 2017, I commenced a certificate in history of family, and then in 2018, went on to do my MA at UL. So I will be introducing you to Isabella Quinn and her diary and, and why she was my case study um, for my MA. 
Um, I intend at a future time to uh, publish Isabella Quinn's diary. Um, I have in principle um, um, agreement from the Wigan Archive in England, um, but I have to, to um, delve into that a bit more as time goes on and uh, publish her written words of 66,000 words, um, which certainly add to the narrative and social history of Nina in Tipperary. So what's ephemera? Is it useful? Um, what are the pitfalls and positives of relying on micro study documents? Um, what are primary source uh, documents? What are secondary source documents? Why are they uh, useful? Why are they important? Um, and memorabilia, things like artifacts, collectibles, posters, and so forth. Um, why is that information or how can that be used to further add richness to research? Ephemera, um, and if you Google it, certainly you will get a lot of material defining ephemera. However, um, it's, it can be defined and, and it should be defined primarily um, with regard to the source or the integrity of the material. A primary source document, such as a diary, and I will talk exclusively about a diary. However, what I'm saying will can also genetically be addressed to other documents, to letters, to journals, and so on. Um, but primary source documents, such as a diary or letters, um, can be regarded as having more probity or integrity than set, perhaps, say, secondary source material, which generally is an interpretation um, of documents. Primary source material, such as diaries, letters, journals, memoirs, minutes, original documents, newspaper articles that witness events, talk about you know, events that were recurring, um, interviews, whether they're digital or audio or written, uh, speeches, photographs, cartography, survey maps, original um, survey maps, census form data, genealogy, genealogical certificates and transcriptions, archival material of landed estate journals or poor law union registers um, or poor law union minutes even, um, original artwork and other first-hand um, and original mediums um, are primary source um, material. It's usually first-hand accounts um, via a participant or a writer. Secondary source material, however, is one step removed um, from the original source. My dissertation about Isabella Quinn um, and her diary is a secondary source as although it, um, it analyzes her diary, um, it gives interpretation and other historical reference. Um, and and those, that further reference helps, to, helps the reader to understand and to place her written dialogue in, in a time frame. Clearly, it can be seen that a document or a journal, or, um, uh, writ is, is a document or a journal written in the first-hand account is extremely useful. One of the pitfalls, however, of a microstudy is that this material, and I'll, I'll, as I say, I'll be talking about diaries, but it applies to all primary source material, is that it, we have a belief and interpretation of the honesty of the writer and the fact that no other material might be available to corroborate the details. So we certainly take it at face, hand, face value. The Irish American academic Una Frawley, which uh, some of you may be familiar with her work, has written several books about historical memory and how memory can be contextual to the times, to society and to the culture of the period. Memory then affects the way a diary is written um, uh, and it can be memory um, of the time um, can influence how a diary is written um, and, and, and as that person is, is living in a particular contextual time frame. A diary is a composition of the interpretation of the world as the writer lived at that particular time. Equally so, the French academic Professor Le, Philip Lejeune talks about the methodology of diary writing and how the function and practices of regular writing reflects how diary accounts are written. Um, some um, people wrote diaries because they like to record their everyday movements and their, act and their activities. Other people wrote diaries as a form of religious observance, that they were specific in terms of their thoughts and feelings um, um, relevant to their beliefs. Um, diary writing 
was different for different writers um, and, and, and in different periods of history. The format and contextual style, therefore, can affect the way a diary is written and it, and it influences the contents of the material. So to some degree, we have to have a fairly um, open-ended um, interpretation of, of, of uh, written diaries because they can mean different things to different people and were meant um, to be different um, mediums when they were written. There is a disclaimer to all this, however, and, a, and that is that a, a diary is an exciting narrative that leads to specificity of place, which is important, and to historical time frame. It's often assumed to be accurate, but can, it also can intend to mislead and to distract and can have material agenda. Now, to give you a specific um, current example of this, for example, um, the current NUI Galway National University of Ireland uh, Galway project, uh, the digitation of um, handwritten letters from Irish immigrants to America. There's been a fair bit of publicity in Ireland um, about this at the, at the you know, just recent times. Um, these letters, um, they detail the living conditions, um, the weather, the family connections of those who left Ireland seeking a better life. Some of these letters reflect a more, propos not the more prosperous, account, prosperous account of life in America than really was the case. Some writers had an agenda of being that they, they didn't want to worry uh, family and the members who were left behind in Ireland and that family members, other family members perhaps, perhaps would be more interested to come to America to join them if they gave a more prosperous um, and a more congenial environment, uh, um, you know, and it counts in their letters. So clearly these letters detailing an extremely significant narrative about life in America and the life of the Irish who emigrated there, and they are primary source material. Some of these letters, however, may be in interpreted to be slightly misleading. And that the field of, of um, digitization of these letters is really quite interesting. Um, Professor Emma Morton, uh, she wrote a doctoral thesis on the linguistics and digital humanities of these letters, Professor Kirby's um, immigrant letters. Um, her doctoral thesis, Professor Emma Morton's doctoral thesis is available online. And I'd encourage anyone to have a look at it if they're interested to delve further into this exciting material, really. Um, also on a slightly different but related note, a good resource um, uh, is uh, a book called Oceans of Consolation, a 1994 published book by the late Professor David Fitzpatrick. It includes um, personal accounts of 14 Irish families who immigrated to Australia. So a similar vein there of, of accounts of life in Australia, um, uh, in, in some instances offering a very um, congenial um, um, description of life where perhaps it may not have necessarily been the case. So my case study, as I said, was of a woman's diary, Isabella Quinn. So who was she? Where did she live? What was her life about, her interest, um, and why is she important? Let me firstly say that Isabella Quinn um, did not live in County Mayo, uh, nor, am I, am, nor am I related to her. Her diary and the snapshot of her life it provides was my case study for my MA. She resided in Nina in County Tipperary. However, um, I think it's important to say, regardless of geography, the same principles of researching her diary, uh, her words and her insight into her life that she provides in a written form in the diary can be applied to any diary document, journal document, a letter, um, anything that you have that uh, can add to your family story or your um, particular research interests. Researching additional historical and contextual information can add richness and flavor to narrative, and it provides depth and character um, development. Isabella Quinn was born according to her own diary notation on the 2nd of July in 1838. Um, no record exists of the birth of her, or of her birth or her baptism. Um, she was the only daughter of Dr. O'Neill Quinn, a doctor in the Nina Workhouse and the Silver Mines Dispensary, and his wife Harriet. She had two siblings, Henry Evans, who was born in 1827, and Charles William. 
The Quinn family were an upper middle class family with connections to landed families. Uh, they resided at Silverton, Silver Street in Nina in County Tipperary. So Isabella's diary is owned and preserved in the Wigan Archive in Wigan in England, which is not far from Manchester. It's part of the Edward Hall collection. The diary, as you can see on this slide here, it's approximately 205 millimetres in height, it's 125 millimetres in width, and it's 30 millimetres in depth. It's not a large book. Um, it's made of paper and has a cover assumed to be of buckram, which was a non-leather fabric used for book binding. The cover is coloured light brown and it has a surface which is smooth to the touch. It has, certainly has a patina of wear on both sides of the cover. There is a book plate label attached on the inside of the front cover, indicating that the diary is part of the Edward Hall collection. And Edward Hall was a collector of mid 19th century women's writings. He was an acclaimed pilot in World War I and II, and he later became a bookseller and purchased Isabella's diary in 1947 for 15 shillings. Um, it hasn't been documented where he purchased that diary from, however. As you can see here, this is the, on the slide, the, this is the catalogue entry from the Edward Hall collection of Wigan. Um, and it's funny how things are described. This would have been described, um, her diary would have been described back in perhaps 1947, 1951, when it, the document was um, handed over to Wigan Archive. And it uh, states that the diary concentrates mostly on the social life of Miss Quinn of Nina County, Tiberi Island, and her attempts to marry herself off to someone. She describes dances, picnics, etc. And an interesting side to the diary was a description of illnesses. Her father was a doctor, and the recurrent features are some of uh, are some of the remedies which make horrifying reading today. The diary is full, maintained, and easy to read. Well, having researched her diary, I am not um, necessarily in agreement to that description at all. Um, she certainly provides uh, information about her life, her, her activities. Um, um, I wouldn't say she, she has um, detail about her attempts to marry herself off. She mixes with the military. She mixes with those of landed um, and standing in the community. Um, and as, as I will go on to talk about her diary, um, it's interesting. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that about her diary at all, having researched it. So Isabella's diary starts on the 1st of January 1866 and it concludes on the 31st of October 1869. Uh, as part of my research, I transcribed each of her diary entries. Upon opening the diary, her format is generally a week's activity to a page. From the 1st of January 1866 until the 31st of December 1866, she had written 13,019 words. The following year, 1867, she recorded 18,936 words. In 1868, a total of 20,568 words. And then in 1869, and in the last 10 months of the diary period, a total of 13,708 words. It's a total of 66,131 words over a 46 month time frame. So she was certainly conscientious and a prolific recorder of her daily activities. I suspect um, that she had diaries, she wrote diaries all her life, but this is the only diary that's in, in existence that I can find, um, which uh, um, um, certainly you know, talks about her life through this period. So if anyone happens to come across a diary of Isabella Quinn, I'd be certainly very interested in um, hearing from you. This is the inside the cover. Uh, of the diary, the slide, and it shows her own handwriting, Elis Isabella Elizabeth Quinn, um, and that's in her own handwriting. This is inside, again, by the cover, the Edward Hall um, faceplate there, um, indicating that um, the diary was given to the Wigan Archive in 1951. The photo here of Edward Hall, um, the claimed pilot, um, and as I stated, he was a bookseller. He married a woman from Wigan and he donated um, over 200 diaries and um, uh, journals and so forth to the Wigan Archive. And they were, uh, his particular interest was women's writings. Um, 
and there's certainly been, and I've seen some of his diaries at Wigan, they're an amazing um, collection. So right there is the Museum of Wigan Life in Wigan, and that's where Isabella's diary is currently held. So when I visited the Wigan archive, I took 400 photos of her diaries pages for later transcription. Each page of Isabella's diary had been recorded, has been recorded as she wrote it. Her diary doesn't contain a lot of detail about relationships or family life or education in uh, the years prior to the commencement of, of this volume. Um, her words are uh, certainly full of energy and participation and in common with some other female diarists of the period, doesn't contain many of her own thoughts or feelings. However, a wealth of information about her life can be extracted. Her diary provides evidence of the contextual environment in which she lived, but also allows insights into her hobbies, her community and religious activities, her Quaker, um, uh, no, sorry, her personal domestic household roles, uh, and she took over her, her roles of the house uh, because the mother Harriet was a Quaker and was involved in uh, charity work. So Isabella therefore took over the social um, etiquette and entertaining of those of standing and military personnel in the town. Um, she was the, as I say, the daughter of a prominent doctor in the town. Uh, and no one knows really, other than uh, myself, really a lot about her diary. Certainly I am the only person to have seen or transcribed her diary since it was gifted to the archive. It's a sig significant commentary on the social and public life of the town and its occupants. And uh, it's certainly my aim to give it recognition um, to uh, Mina and to others, uh, the recognition that it deserves. So a diary is often thought to be a personal document. Um, although in the, in the 19th century, women participated in readings of their diaries. Um, uh, you know, there was some similar um, groups, sim similar to what we have like book reading clubs and so forth. Women got together and, and uh, um, read each other's diaries and, and discussed them. A writer of a diary doesn't by nature explain relationships uh, generally in the diary, because of course it's, it's generally thought to be a personal document. I thought therefore in researching Isabella's diary, had to research every person and place that Isabella referred to. Um, and certainly that, that um, uh, periphery information and broad research adds to character and, and adds um, depth to the story of her life. My research then certainly revealed that details about her family, for example, Dr. Anil Quinn, Isabella's father, uh, was born in uh, County Leach in Ireland in 1796. He matriculated from the University of Edinburgh and he graduated as a doctor in 1822. He wrote a thesis at the time, which was all about continuous fever, um, and he certainly worked in the fever hospital in Nina. His uh, thesis was written in Latin and a copy of it, uh, his thesis still exists at the University of, of Edinburgh today. He was involved and um, certainly there are many reports in the Nina Guardian about his life and work. He was involved in um, the workhouse, in the Nina infirmary, um, uh, in uh, at the Silver Mines dispensary. Um, he was certainly also involved um, in the Nina Poor Law Union. Um, he has many reports of his um, um, care, the care that he took of, of um, the inmates of the Nina workhouse and how he cared for them and, and supported a better diet for them. Um, he, um, he was also a medical consultant at the Nina barracks at the time. So Dr. Quinn married Harriet Harding, Isabella's mother in 1824. And she was important because she was the, the daughter of William Harding of Kings County um, and later of a landed estate Beechwood, which is near Nina. Isabella's sister Elizabeth married Sir Henry Osborne who was a baronet and therefore again establishing their social class. This connection was particularly important for Isabella as she had standing as the daughter of the, not only of the local doctor, but also she had standing and respectability within the landed gentry and those um, of power in the community. As I stated, Harriet Quinn, Isabella's mother was Quaker and she spent a lot of time doing charity work. And certainly there's reference to her um, on uh, 
on the Pasta Commercial Database, where she applied for money to set up a soup, ki soup kitchen in Limerick. Isabella Quinn, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Quinn, Isabella's uh, father and his wife Harriet are buried together in uh, Kenyon Street Cemetery in Nina. Um, and I have photographs of them in memorial stones. So upon reading and researching Isabella's diary, it's important to note that she was well supported and, and um, cared for by her parents. Um, she was given more responsibility, um, perhaps than one would uh, suggest at the time, um, because she took on, on roles that her mother would have normally have taken over at that time. Isabella had two brothers, and they're important also because they had um, a standing within the British Army. At the time of the commencement of this diary in uh, the 1st of January 1866, her brother Charles had, had predeceased her, had died. Although me no mention is made of him in this particular volume of the diary, the Nina Guardian newspaper in 1953 states that he attended the military college at Sandhurst and was later appointed to the British Army, where he was in command of several regiments. He, uh, unlike many men of his social class, obtained his entry to Sandhurst on merit. Uh, not by purchasing a commission. He died in India in 1860. In her diary, Isabella talks lovingly about her other sibling, Henry. He was born in 1827. He joined the British Army at the age of 18. He attained standing in command of several regiments also, and he achieved the ranking of Lieutenant Colonel. He served in India, he married his wife, Kate, and he had several children there. Kate um, is often referred to in Isabella's diary and referred to as Dear Kate. Um, and uh, she travelled with her children to Nina and she, throughout the entirety of this diary, she's mentioned she lived at Silverton with the Quinn family and she was involved heavily in Isabella's life. Isabella's, uh, Henry, Isabella's brother, died in military service in India in 1873, which is well outside the time frame of this diary. He was buried with military honours and his military estate papers, which are available via a commercial database from the past, revealed that Katie's wife was sent various mementos uh, upon his death, which included his gold signet ring, his two Bibles, his silver hunting watch and his photographic scrapbook. He was also an excellent singer, and when he was home in Nina, the Nina Guardian, the local newspaper of the time, and, and still exists today, um, wrote various reports of him um, singing uh, at community activities and religious events and so forth. Here's a picture of a slide of uh, Isabella's uh, handwriting. Um, and actually, it's the first day of the diary of the of 1st of January, 1866. Um, and I think seeing um, uh, personal handwriting gives you a connection and gives you a feeling. Um, so it's not only through the words of a diary, but it's actually seeing how the diary was written, seeing how um, letters were formed, seeing the handwriting, which um, can be really relevant. So as I said, um, I didn't know anything about Isabella Quinn's life and it was a personal document, her diary. So in her diary, she didn't go on to explain who was who and how they were related to, to other uh, members. So I had to research her diary. Um, down in the right hand corner, you can see Isabella Quinn um, and her husband there, Faulkner Eyre, who later becomes her, her husband. Um, above that, you can see her uh, parents, Dr. Quinn and Harriet Harding. So a little bit of a brief description there, um, a bit of a family tree of Isabella Quinn. Um, I actually like to keep uh, family trees fairly simple because they're, they're quite clear to see um, relationships to, to other members. I then went on to do um, the family tree of her brother. As, uh, I'll just go back aside there. Um, Charles William, to the left of Isabella's um, Xbox there, Charles William had died, um, he didn't marry, her sibling Charles had died, her other sibling, sibling Henry Evans did marry and have children and I've done a little summary there of um, Henry's family tree and who the particular people were um, and um, their date frame, the date, uh, time frames and so forth.
This is a picture of, it's related to Nina, obviously, because that's where the diary is situated, um, an Ordnance Survey map. Um, now, photographic evidence and newspaper reports and books of historical information set the scene and provide context and family research. For my research, I used a number of sources of evidence, you know, land maps, cancellation books, photographs, journal articles, weather reports, weather event reports, and also used traveler's diaries. While traveler's diaries were not specific to Nina in part, they certainly give a flavor and a feel um, about um, traveling and the geography um, of on the island of Ireland and its town people. So it's, it's relevant um, to provide that additional extra content um, uh, from other material that's available. And although it's not specific at times to the time frame of a particular document, such as a diary, it gives broader flavor, it gives certainly broader historical significance. Um, and it gives a richness, um, it gives further story to um, the research that you're doing. This actual survey map is of the town of Nina um, and points out where the, the chapel is, where the station is, and um, certainly some of the landed estates. Again, I went on to place the diary, the geography, um, looked at maps of Ireland, looked at um, where Tipperary was, county, um, um, counties bordering it and so forth. And certainly I've, I'm included there and location of the town, uh, town map of Bellavari, Newcastle Bar, particularly that I was looking at for my Mayo um, relationships and family history. So again, broad and contextual information adds the story and adds um, um, flavor and richness and depth to the research that you may be doing. These photographs are from the Lawrence Collection at the National Library of Ireland, um, and they were taken by Robert French, who was a junior photographer to, to um, um, uh, Lawrence. Um, I've just temporarily forgotten his, um, his um, Christian name. Um, but here was the courthouse, for example, in Nina, and also the barracks, the military barracks at Summer Hill. Again, um, William Lawrence, sorry, there you go, junior photographer to William Lawrence. The 13th century Normal Castle, which stands in Nina in County Tipperary today, um, and a view there of the market uh, cross where fairs were held on a regular basis. Um, and uh, uh, the fair days are often referred to in Isabella Quinn's diary. Uh, and she attended the fairs um, and talks about the produce and the stalls that were um, um, arranged there at the market cross. So it gives a photographic picture. Um, and it's certainly worth looking for photographs um, in various sources relevant to Paps Mayer or relevant um, on the wider berth through the National Library of Ireland. This is a picture of um, um, Silverton, which is the residence which uh, Isabella Quinn and the Quinn family resided in. Uh, it still stands today. Um, it has a, a uh, business in the downstairs um, area there. However, that that uh, there is another business there presently. Um, I know Isabella um, on the right hand top corner, Isabella looked out that window when she was writing her diary. Um, I've, I've been in the ground floor area um, of the building. Um, I haven't been through where the premises, the building, the, the business is actually um, working there, but I've been, been through, as I said, the, the, um, the ground floor area. And it was interesting just to go through the building um, and get a feel of the, there's not much historical content there left now, but just get a feeling of, of where she walked. Um, uh, so that was really of interest. Also through the carriageway on the right hand side, I know from valuation documents that there was an extensive garden attached to Silverton. Um, if you go through the carriageway today, you'll find a large car park. But but this certainly was uh, a very large garden full of fruit trees. Um, and I know from newspaper accounts that on one occasion, um, Isabella confronted some youths who were climbing over the wall into the garden and she pulled a gun on them. Um, and that's all recorded. Um, I suppose she was uh, fearful of her life perhaps at the time uh, because there was certainly a lot of um, um, things going on in Nina and in surrounding streets. There was a lot of disruptive um, 
elements going on. Um, so perhaps she was fearful for her life and she pulled a gun on these particular youth. And that's recorded in the Nene Guardian and the court cases is recorded in the Nene Guardian as well. Also in her diary, she talks about um, landed estates. And of course, they're all specific to Nina. Um, she traveled to landed estates. She spent uh, copious amounts of time um, having holidays at landed estates because she had a, a very easy relationship with those of, of the landed um, um, society. Although she wasn't of landed means herself, she was certainly um, through her mother's ancestry, she was acknowledged um, and she lived a very, um, her life, uh, she lived a very um, um, gracious life in that she was acknowledged by the landed almost of, as a, an equal. She uh, argued with uh, members of the landed estate um, society. So that's the level on which, and she talks about that in her diary, um, and that's the level upon which she was accepted. So I listed all her landed estates and I then had to research those estates. Where were they? Were they this, were their current um, buildings? Were they currently still standing? Um, who were the people of those landed estates? Were they well known? What was their claims to fame? Um, and generally, um, those of landed uh, in society were community members of, of standing in, in um, and positions of power in the community. So that led on to, as I say, researching those landed estates. On the right hand side, I also in my dissertation listed um, some of the names of people that Isabella refers to. And of course, because it was, her diary is a private document, I didn't know who these people were. And she didn't then go on to explain. It was, it was assumed that it was a private document. There was no need for her to go into detail about who the people were. So I had to then research who the people were um, and what the relationship um, of those people was to her. Um, so that was a, an interesting um, exercise using all sorts of material, primary resource material that was available and also relying heavily on the local newspaper of the time, the Nina Guardian. Well, also in the diary talks about books that she um, uh, had read. Um, she will refer to a book, I've, you know, I started reading a particular book or I finished a book. It was a very pretty story or something of that nature. So as part of my research, I analysed the books that she read and the authors and the genres and the themes and plot lines. She read 51 books over a 46 month time frame. They were mostly fiction by English or Irish writers, but she also read a couple of religious texts. In this era, era, it was common for literary salons to be organised uh, by the upper classes, a little bit by, like you know, book club societies that we have today. Um, and there was an opportunity for social connection, but also there was a discussion and critique of the, the um, literary works. Exposure to various authors invited diverse outcomes in the field of education or for amusement, enjoyment, moral fortitude and instruction. Isabella read books from authors such as Gaskell, Sheridan Le Fanu, Margaret Oliphant, Charlotte Riddell, Annie Edwards, Letitia Maybell, Mortimer Collins, Rhonda Brougham, um, and she was a controversial author at the time, uh, Trollope, clergyman Dr. Pusey, White Melville, Dickens, and many others. Many of the other, many of the authors at the time, particularly women, used pseudonyms when publishing uh, or to carry forth their readership from their previously published works, which were in magazine editions. I also looked at uh, Isabella's activities. Um, what did she do with the time? Um, what were the most regular things that she did? Um, what were the, um, what was she expected to do? What were the expectations of women in society at that particular point of time in the, in the 19th century? Because certainly um, um, money or wealth were not particular indicators of society and the level of society that you, you resided in. That was certainly very helpful, but they weren't necessarily indicators of society at the time. So Isabella did have um, a public and a private life. Um, and um, 
she was certainly involved in many things. Her diary is full of energy, as I say. She was involved, she walked everywhere. She read quite copiously. She was involved in social um, activities, um, uh, entertaining military personnel, um, and particularly Knight of her brothers were involved in the military. She had extensive um, relationships with those in the military. Um, she was involved in dressmaking. She could, she could sew her own dresses. Um, she made her own um, Garibaldi blouses, but she also relied on um, seamstresses in the local community. She lent, attended religious lectures. Um, she made cartridges uh, for the hunt. Um, she did a lot of craft work. Um, she took holidays. She attended the library in Nina exclusively. Um, she sang, she played the piano and, and uh, she was heavily involved in, in um, Church of Ireland activities. So I did a bit of an analysis of what she did. She certainly had a private and a public life. And as I say, money and wealth were not necessarily indicators of class or position in society, although they helped. Um, lifestyle, manners, speech, her clothing style, her education, her deportment were also parts, um, part of her personal traits of respectability. Uh, her diary uh, records not only um, the pattern on routine of each day, but also those activities that she was involved in. After breakfast, she received and responded to correspondence, um, which came from friends, family, officers, or invitations from landed uh, families for the many social occasions uh, and events. She may have sat in a drawing room, and I know that she had a drawing room, and I know, as I'll show you shortly, um, for an advertisement that appeared in the local paper after her father died, where she was selling off um, the various um, pieces of furniture from the house. In the drawing room, she would have had a drawing box, um, and uh, the drawing room was generally thought of the women's room. So she would have um, sat in the drawing room and wrote letters and responded to letters using her drawing box. Here, as I, I've mentioned on the left-hand side, it's an advertisement that appeared in the local paper after her father died, um, and she was selling off various household furniture and items. Um, included in the drawing room were the pianoforte and the stool, the harp, um, the pillows, the sofa, the armchairs, um, the lithograph, uh, the rugs, the chintz um, um, chairs and so forth. Um, what was in the dining room, um, her sideboard, um, side tables, the carpets, um, what was in the hall, um, what was in the pantry, um, and so on and so forth. So it gives you the local paper it can be a mind, um, can, can, can hold a minefield of information based on things like um, estate um, advertisements or details about um, birth or death or social activities that occurred um, in the town in Nina or in Mayo specific to your research. Uh, I also then had to, uh, as part of the diary, the diary was a specific 40 month, 46 month time frame. So I then had to research what happened to Isabella after the period of the diary. Um, and I did this by looking at research, uh, sorry, census research material. Um, I looked again at newspapers. Um, I know uh, that uh, Isabella died in, uh, um, in England. Um, I obtained her marriage certificate. She died in Kent and she's buried with her husband, um, Faulkner Eyre. So I, I then went on abroad in my research to find out more of the fuller story of Isabella. What happened to her? Um, uh, what was she involved in? Um, and I was happy to find out that she married. Um, unfortunately, her husband only survived her, uh, only lived for a couple of months after their um, wedding. Um, and then she went on to um, live for many years in England after that. Uh, this is where Isabella and her husband um, are buried in the grounds of St. Peter's Church in Relation, Kent. I didn't unnecessarily research for her husband Faulkner Eyre. What was his claim to fame? Um, where did perhaps he meet Isabella? Um, I now know that um, uh, Faulkner Eyre was also from Nina. As it turned out, he was also in the Paul Law Union at the time. Um, 
And he also had connections, not only to Nina, but to Kent. So I went on to research. He was of a, of a quite influential family. And on the bottom of the second slide, you can see where he's listed in the family tree, um, marrying Isabella Quinn. So he had extensive ancestry um, and they were of social influence also. Well, as I mentioned, uh, Isabella was involved in private and in, in public sphere activities as, as women were um, of the time. Um, authors such as um, Maria Luddy um, talks of, about um, women and their 19th, in the 19th century, the roles women played um, and um, where they uh, saw themselves in society. Um, I'm just trying to find a couple of authors. I listed a couple of authors um, if anyone was interested. Um, people like Marie Luddis, Sally Mitchell, Lydia Murdoch, Mary O'Dowd, Maeve O'Regan. Um, there's certainly um, good authors to research if you're looking at um, women's roles in society, um, particularly in the mid 19th century. So a few details there are specific to Isabella, um, the role she played in a public environment, a public sphere, and also in her private life. Then, as I've mentioned, um, in order to uh, have a clearer and more concise, but also a broader picture of the snapshot in time that Isabella's diary um, provides. I looked at newspaper, record, uh, newspaper reports, valuations, data, Griffith valuation details. I looked at deeds, local directories, accounts of land and properties um, and estate um, registers, books, journals, um, uh, articles. I looked at research in archives and libraries. I looked and read about um, authors of the time in their particular fields, as I was talking about Maria Luddy. Um, looked at podcasts, listened to podcasts, talks on history of towns and architecture, looked at genealogical certificates using commercial databases, cemetery transcriptions um, and online uh, searches, um, travellers accounts, whatever I could find to gave me a broader picture and a more comprehensive standing um, to fulfil the research. So Isabella and Elizabeth Quinn um, certainly left a legacy to the people and society of Nina and County Tipperary. And as I mentioned, I certainly um, wish to make the diary transcription um, available um, and have it published um, uh, in time to come. I'm certainly in, in some discussion with the Wigan Archive at this point of time. Isabella Quinn's last diary entry was on the 31st of October 1869, but however, her story continued um, and I gathered that information by piecing together various reports of primary and secondary source data, such as newspaper items, as I've said, and vital certificates and census data. So it's certainly uh, a story. The diary certainly is it was a journal, a diary, letters provide, they are pieces of ephemera and they provide uh, richness and they provide a depth and an understanding um, of the life and times of particular people. Um, in my case, I was lucky to, to find Isabella Quinn and, and be involved in the research of, of and history, not only of her life and her family, but what she contributed and, and how her diary contributes to the social standing of people in Nina, but also the social and historical um, uh, description of, of life of the time. So I hope that you, in this pre presentation, I've provided you with some insights and awareness of the significance of ephemera. Um, and I've talked specifically about a diary. However, you can broaden that to, to um, talk about um, and have reference to journal and letters and so forth. And it can, can certainly contribute to further understanding and development um, in your comprehensive research, be it family history or, or some other research of particular interest you may have. So I thank you for the opportunity of presenting today. Um, it's certainly been something that I've certainly looked forward to. Um, I now invite questions and if you're in, in any way interested, I'm more than happy to be in contact um, at a later date about anything referring specifically to my talk. So thank you, Michael, and thank you for everyone for listening in. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Carmel, for what was a very informative and, uh, and thought-provoking uh, presentation. 
Uh, we're going to open it up to questions in a moment, but um, I'm going to um, just start by, um, I suppose it's part statement, part question. As you work through each of your slides, uh, Carmen, I was kind of asking myself, well, what is this giving me over and above if I started with a blank sheet um, and I was looking at building a family tree for Isabella Quinn, what, what, is, what, what does the diary give me uh, over and above all the other sources that are there? And what really brought it home to me was your slide, I think it was, it was headed leisure activities, because I thought that was just a fantastic graph because it took you from you know, the world of, 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 of you know, dull documents and papers and records and all those kind of things we look at when we're looking at family trees into the thoughts and minds and feelings and uh, of uh, Isabella Quinn. So I thought for me that was really important and then and really highlighted the importance of the diary. The diary. I think secondly, for me, the, the, the important point was that the day the diary ends and you revert to the world of um, you know, the, the, the other records, the usual records. And so my question really relates to that. And I think, did you find that once the diary ended, that the world of Isabella Quinn became considerably less interesting, um, considerably less, uh, I suppose, informative in terms of your own work. Um, and did you ultimately come to a conclusion that really this is all about the diary? Um, yes and no. Certainly, this is all about the diary. This is a significant existing document um, that. Uh, is held in the Wigan Archive. It is certainly all about the diary. Um, and um, Isabella Quinn was an individual, but her document um, has, has st stands the time um, and, and continues to inform um, those of Nina, but also those interested in, in Irish history um, about the life and times that, that she lived. So it's certainly about the diary. However, it's also about the individual. Oh, there I am back in the screen. It's certainly all about the individual and um, her interests and her life, um, her relationships. Um, uh, and um, I, and I, I think um, it, 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 you look at it in a more comprehensive um, format. Um, it is about herself as an individual. It is about um, social history. Um, but it is on a broader scale. After her diary finished, I was quite disappointed. And I then had to find out what happened to her. How did she live? Where did she live? What were her relationships with people? Did she continue to uh, enjoy the activities that um, the, the small snapshot in her diary provided? Um, so in some ways it was, it was really exciting once her diary had finished to try and find her again and what happened and what documents supported her life and the life that she was then living. Um, so I, I, I find the whole um, gamut of research on her is really exciting and, and really interesting. So um, it is about the diary, but it is so much more and it's so much more about her as a woman living in the 19th century. Very good. Okay, we're going to try and uh, do a little um, jiggery poker here with the technology and see if uh -huh. we can open up the um, some questions. Um, so I think if um, you wish to answer a question, you need to raise your hand and then we will unmute you to enable you to, uh, to ask your question. Okay, so Michael... Casey, I'm going to try and turn you on, Michael. Hold on a second. Okay, Michael. Hello, can you hear me there? We can indeed. Yes. So, uh, no, just a curiosity at the end of this, and as, as Michael said, you very much get a three dimensional picture of your subject. Did you, did you like her what, 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 oh, as, as a person? <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm enormously impressed by her, her enthusiasm, her written style, her activities, her involvements, her relationships. Um, I'm, I'm impressed by her character. Um, you know, she argued with the with people of landed standing at the time. Um, I'm really impressed. I, I loved her. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Do you have anybody else? A question? Maybe I'll just 
put one more thing out there while um, others maybe just thinking about formulating a, a, um, a question. You mentioned early on about the dangers of picking up this document or documents like this, and that they can be written from a perspective or written from a um, with an idea of conveying something that is uh, perhaps not quite reality and, and the dangers around that. And of course, that's absolutely true. And we see that with newspaper reports and, uh, and all sorts of things. My question relates to something very, very specific. In the late 18th century, there was an event in North Mayo uh, where uh, a good number of people lost their lives. And uh, it was heavily reported in the press in England and in Ireland as well. And a folklore narrative has built up around that, which um, uh, has been published and then is reasonably well known. And it, it places it in a particular place in North Mayo, talks about the individuals, talks about the numbers dead. Crucially, it talks about why it happened. Um, last year in the British archives, I found a letter written by a woman again, um, and she was either a witness to or exceptionally close to one of the senior military people involved. And her account of what happened is utterly different from everything that's written and all it, it obliterates the folklore. She has no personal interest in the letter, that's very clear. And her perspective is not that of the military or the authorities. It is the perspective of the people who suffered on the day. Um, it's a lengthy letter, it's hard to read. Um, and uh, it's written to her father. So it's quite a personal letter as well. Her father took the letter and gave it to the senior military authorities in London, um, and nothing was done with it. Do I take the letter that this lady Jane wrote as being the history on the day, or do I bow to 200 years of folklore um, and what were undoubtedly or possibly very self-serving um, newspaper articles written at the time? I think that's where it's really relevant to suggest that you need to, if, if at all possible, you need to corroborate your information. Um, you know, it's it's wonderful to have letters, it's wonderful to have diaries and journal entries, and there's certainly a first-hand account. So you have to give them the authority and the integrity that, that and respect that they're um, deemed. However, um, it is just one person's account and, um, information can be skewed for all sorts of reasons. Um, if that's the only information that's available, certainly perhaps that letter is of more integrity than the, than the generalized folklore of the time. However, mm -hmm. if there are other sources of, or, or if it can be researched and found to be other sources that corroborate the information, again, um, that is of more use, but, but that can't always occur. So, it would be my belief that having a handwritten document of the time um, detailed the sp detailing the specifics would have more probity and more integrity than the generalized folklore um, and story of the time. But um, it, that's open to interpretation um, and, in and open to further research um, and comprehensive research, I'd suggest. Her letter, she... Um makes a statement about a particular individual um, who is well known in North Mayo and was in a position of authority in Mayo, North Mayo for a very long time, 30 or 40 years. If she makes a statement, um, and she doesn't suggest forgery, but she does suggest something uh, nefarious or something that's not good. Over a 40 year period, this person demonstrated time and time again that they would go to any lengths, including forgery, uh, etc. to achieve their ends. And I think that um, for me her letter is just amazing because in a throwaway statement she captured an individual, the mindset and the you know, that just played out over decades after she completely disappears and we have no idea what happened to her. I believe she was a daughter of a wheelwright um, mm -hmm. in uh, Hammersmith in London. And beyond that we just don't know but it is interesting. Now, does anybody else have any more questions before we let uh, Carmel go? Uh, what time is it with you? It must be 6 a.m. Um, it's about 6 a.m. in the morning. Yes, it's 5 past 6 in the morning. Do we have any more, uh, more questions before we go? 
Okay. Well, with that, we're going to end it there. And Carmel, sincere thank you for coming thank along you. to um, do this for us this evening. And um, the um, recording of this hopefully will be available over the next uh, couple of weeks for anybody else uh, who wants to uh, watch it. So thank you very much. And thank you all for attending this evening and uh, supporting this event. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks,